We have the opportunity today to hear from a good friend of mine who has uh, been in the mission field for a number of years. He served with his wife in Grenada. Anybody ever been to Grenada? Look at you guys. Okay. I hardly even know how to spell it. Um, but it's it's in the Mediterranean. It's not necessarily a really tough place to serve, I suppose, with respect to weather. But I'm sure there are lots of challenges otherwise. There you go. And then they've also served in southern Mexico. And today, uh, Lane and Cindy hit up an organization called Calvary Relief International. And it can be shortened out CRI, which, how would you say CRI? Cry. Cry for the nations. So they have a ministry that's serving throughout the world um, with some emphasis today in Africa because that's where the needs have come up and where God has led. But I know that he's going to tell you about what they're doing and what about what uh, God wants to teach us today through him. And he's been with us before at least one time, I think maybe two times. And we're just really happy to be able to welcome back today Lane Weddingle. Please help me. Okay. Well, he said there's not very many people here today because they knew we were coming. Is that what? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I'll start by introducing my beautiful wife, Cindy, back there, the one with the natural silver shining hair back there. Uh, she, we have been married for almost 42 years now, by the grace of God. And she has been following me around the world doing missionary stuff for the last 38 years now. Can you believe it? So she, she's with me today. And then I also have Eric with us. And he's a, kind of a new member to our Team Cry. Um, he's been helping us with uh, setting up. And he's learning the ministry enough to be able to explain and uh, what we do. And then he came with his uh, sidekick on his side, which is Shelby. And Shelby and I, and Shelby and, and us, and we, and all of us together, Shelby and us, I guess, um, have been spending a lot of time together for the last three years. And she is one of my disciples, I guess, in missions. And she is now an intern for uh, Calvary Relief International. And she's going to speak a little bit at the end after I finish up. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, if you have it. I hope you do. And I'm going to ask you to open up to two different places, please. Um, put your finger in Mark chapter 6. Actually, I'll just have that because um, the other verse I was going to have you go to is only one, one sentence, so I won't make you go there. I'm going to start off, we're going to get there in a few minutes, but I'm going to start off in um, Psalm chapter 20, chapter 72, verse 12 and 13. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and your love towards us. Without those things, where would we be? Without those things, without your love, your grace, and your mercy, we would be dust in the earth. But because of them, you have made us world changers. You've made us men and women who are filled with your spirit to go into the world and go into our neighborhoods and to share that great love that you have for the rest of the world. We thank you so much, Father, for how you love us and how you want to better our lives and how you want to help us through life and how you want to use us in our lives to glorify you and to bring others into your kingdom. So I pray that your voice would be heard this morning and that we would be drawn closer to you and the work that you want to do in our lives and around the world. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm not sick but it sounds like it, so don't worry about it when we come up and start shaking hands. Um, got some sort of a throat thing going on the last couple of years, so i got to get it checked out one of these days. But in Psalm chapter 72, verse 12, it says, God will rescue the poor who cry out and the afflicted who have no helper. He will spare the poor and will save the souls of the needy. 
this verse is one of the foundational ver verses for the ministry of Calvary Relief International. It was one of the first verses that really spoke to my heart when I started seeking him. You know, I spent a lot of time in Africa and around the world, many different um, countries. I've had the privilege of being in 20 different countries, 22 different countries now, about half as many as Brit. Um, so it's, it's just been a blessing to look through the word and know that the word is directing my ministry. I have journals and we have all of my speaking engagements that I go through on a frequent basis to make sure that I'm still following those handful of verses that God gave me in the beginning of this ministry. God will rescue. He will rescue the poor. God will rescue the afflicted, those who cry out and have no helper. He will spare the poor and he will save the souls of the needy. That's not a doesn't have a question mark around that behind it. It's something that when I was asking the Lord, how do I go forward with this calling in my life? This verse said, I will do it. I'm the one that's going to do these things. It's not you. I want to share a few more foundational verses, and I'm going to go somewhere with them. But in also um, in that verse and in Psalm. Um, before I go on, I'm sorry. The first question that comes to mind is how is he going to do these things? Is it just by osmosis or is it just because we want them to happen or is it because we think good thoughts and all of a sudden the needy is going to get saved and the poor is going to get fed? And is it because um, maybe part of it is because we do pray for the poor and the needy? Maybe it is because we give a little money here and there. Um, but I think it's more than that. I think that we have more of a responsibility to the people around us that have major problems in their lives. And then on top of that, I think that m most of us have a responsibility to the rest of the world. And we'll go there a little, a little later. But in also in Exodus chapter 3, it's where God is, God is speaking to Moses from the burning bush, and he says, I have heard the cry of my people, and I'm concerned. I'm concerned for them. Look, I have, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to start over, I'm sorry. I have heard the cry of my people, and I am concerned about their suffering. Look, I have come down to rescue them. And Moses would have been off the hook right at that point if God wouldn't have gone forward with what he was saying. Look, I have come down to rescue them. So go now, Moses, I am sending you. In Genesis chapter 12, God tells Abraham, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And then in Luke chapter 10, verse 22, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more laborers. <clears throat> These verses are more than just something to meditate on. These verses are invitations for believers of Jesus Christ to get involved in what God wants to do around the world. They're an open invitation. We all love invitations to parties and to go into somebody's house to have dinner, especially if you don't have to bring anything, right? Guys. It's, it's beautiful. We love. We know that we're being invited because they like us and they, or they want to get us to know us better or, or maybe they just you know want to fellowship with us and pray with us. And, um, but invitations are good. All of those verses that I just read are invitations for followers of Jesus Christ to get involved in the work and the heart of God. God has a heart for the broken. He has a heart for the poor. He has a heart for the widows and the orphans. He has a heart for those who have never heard his name. These verses are clear, a clear calling to me in the missions ministries that I've been working in for many years. It's pretty clear that God, what God wants to do for this broken world if we only trust him as believers. 
I think that he does do a lot of things without our consent, and I think he does things um, without our help. But I know that his preferred manner is to work through believers. I believe that we have a calling to make a difference in this world. Not where it's comfortable only and not where it's clean and the temperature is right. He said something about Grenada, and we were talking about Grenada on the way here this morning, the, the demon possession there and the, the witchcraft and the, the horrible things that happen of the cults that are there hiding away from the rest of the world to be able to freely worship their demons and their gods. It's a horrible place even though it's got beautiful white sandy beaches and beautiful 78-degree water and fish like this. We pretty much survived off of fish. But the truth is, is that these places that look so beautiful on the postcard have a spiritual underlying. And that underlying is deceiving people and make, making sure that they never hear the gospel or if they do, that they shun it and never follow it. It's a lot the same here. It's just a little more blatant, though. It's in your face here, isn't it? There, they mix it all together. This is religion, whether you call them G Jesus or their demons or whatever. It's a, it's a horrible... If, you, if you, we could look through God's spiritual eyes and see the earth, you would see that um, there is a huge black spot on the earth. And that's the part where nobody in that black spot all the way is called the 1040 window, isn't it? And then on both sides of that 1040 window by several thousand miles, maybe, um, it's barely reached, if reached at all. But I believe that God looks down and he sees those dark areas on a regular basis and he's saying, you, I want you to go. You, I want you to pray. You, I want you to give. You, I want you to help Lane as he talks about these places, as he goes to these places. I'm called to go. I'm called to help. I'm called to be physically and emotionally and mentally involved. I started this ministry six years ago um, fearful. I think I'm jumping my head a little bit, but fearful because I've been in missions for a long time, and I know how they're received around in your, friend, in your circle of friends. Missions is a burden to most people. Uh, to be honest, missions is a burden to most people. They don't want to get involved. Their bit, lives are busy. But I believe that God has called us to go steps farther. I have come to learn that there are two opposite meanings to the same phrase. You know the phrase. The phrase is, but God. There's a problem, but God. But what happens when you change that and you put a question mark behind it when he calls you to do something that's life-changing, that you have to give up everything and you have to step forward and you say, but God, are you kidding me? That's tough. That's hard. It's hard to put, every, put down everything and then move to another part of the world or to give money that I don't really have to be able to make it so that people can hear the gospel for maybe the first time or eat one pinch of food every week. Every week. I believe that there is, one is used in doubt and fear and the other one gives God glory. But God, or but God, really? In the example above, we see Moses' response, his first response to his calling, that I have come down to rescue my people, now go to Pharaoh. And he says, but God, I stutter. Later on, we see, after he has experienced some life-changing examples or life-changing experiences with God, watching him work, watching him with the plagues, watching him with the miracles, standing there in fear as his, snake, as his staff turns into a snake, having the boldness maybe to pick it up by the tail and watch it turn back into a staff again. All of these things gave him boldness and gave him faith. 
helped him to grow in his faith to where finally, uh, many months later, you would see him on the shores of Red Sea saying, on the shores of the Red Sea saying, but God, no question mark. He knew that one more problem in front of him, one more obstacle, one more disaster, potential disaster was going to be solved by his creator, the man who followed, he followed, or the God that he followed. Another example is King David. He used, but God, when they came to him and, and said that he was going to be a, the king of Israel, and I think he was only 12 or 13 or 15 or something like that, very young. He says, but I'm the least, but God, I'm the least of my family, and my family is the least of all of Israel. But a few years later, all of a sudden, that's changed, and he's standing at the valley where the war was stagnant. There was no nothing happening, and because on that side was Goliath calling over his people, and the, the and the people of Israel were fearful, saying, "But God, he's going to hurt me." David went from "But God, I'm the smallest" to "But God, and I'm going to hold your head up, and I'm going to feed it to the birds." so that the whole world will know that there's a God over Israel. That's not a Sunday school rhyme or a Sunday school story only that says that you can also conquer all of your, your, your giants. That was done to tell us that there was a God over Israel to tell the whole world at that time that there was a God that protected his people, that watched over his people, that lived inside of his people, and that was using his people to make a difference in the world, to get rid of the evil, to get rid of the, the violence and, the, and the, the horror of that giant and his people. Many times we hear uh, in the Bible that people would come up to the to the Israelites and say, we've heard what your God has done. It saved Rahab, didn't it? We've heard that your God is faithful and loves you. How we respond to God when he shows us big problems around us determines how much he is able to use you and me to fix those problems. What is your knee-jerk response when you hear about two major problems in the world? The first one would be that 80%, over 80%, now with COVID and now with the war in, in, Hung in um, where are we? Ukraine, excuse me. She went to Hungary to help the re refugees. I always think Hungary first. Um, but with that war and with Putin and his gas, whatever he's doing with diesel and gas and all of that, it's more than 80%, it's probably 90% of the world now is living in extreme poverty. Just in the last eight to 10 months in Kenya and Burundi where we work, the cost of living has more tripled, not just doubled, it has tripled. They say that $100 of food that you could buy eight months ago would now cost you $300. We send approximately, what was it, almost $100,000 for food and emergency um, help there. $100,000 right now, or $100,000 right now is, is like nothing compared to what it was even just eight months ago. But we still have commitments. And we still know people who are dying of starvation. Calvary Chapel born-again believers that are dying of, of starvation. Many people go two, three, and even five days between pinches of food. I'm not talking full-blown steak meals. I'm talking pinches of cornmeal that's boiled, that has no flavor, and they, we give them cornmeal. It's a life sustenance. It keeps them alive. 
It doesn't put any meat on their bones. It doesn't put any health to them. I mean, people still die of, of malnutrition and they still die of, of sicknesses and things like that. But at least we're keeping them alive and we're preaching the gospel to them. And when they do die, it's, it's sad. You have to make a choice. When they do die, at least now they're going to heaven. Right? We've seen the Calvary Chapel movement in these tribal areas going like wildfire. Tens of thousands of people in Burundi in southern Kenya and northern Kenya are coming to the Lord. We're planting churches. We are drilling wells. We're giving food. We're giving Bibles. We're helping with medical. We are doing everything in our power to help them to live long enough for them to hear the gospel. I've been in refugee camps near the border of South Sudan. I've been in South Sudan at wartime. I've been in Liberia at wartime, and they're desperate situations. So many times we forget that there are Christians that are caught up in these travesties. But the real travesty is that God would have to say, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Have you ever gone down maybe towards... Um, Series or down there in the valley somewhere, and you see, you know, 5,000 acres of tomatoes or asparagus or whatever it is. What a travesty if they cannot get workers to pick it when it's ripe. And that's exactly what God is saying that there is the harvest is ripe. It's time to pick, it's time to harvest, it's time to bring in the hall, it's time to fill up the kingdom of God with worshipers. And what we do is we step back and say, but God, I have my responsibility, but God, I don't have enough, but God. That's my voice is making it sound so tragic. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so we have 80% of the world that lives in extreme poverty. There is no safety net. There is nothing like that. There's no unemployment. There's no social security. Security benefits, there's no health care, there's no stimulus checks, there is no neighbor to help, there is no welfare program, and there is no food stamps. If a man cannot work, he cannot eat, or if he cannot gather, he cannot eat. And in the areas that we're working now, the drought is so bad that nothing is growing and their animals are dying. So they can't even live off the milk or the roots that they, they usually pull. We're talking thousands of Calvary Chapel believers now in the last six years, thousands. And they're still struggling for their next meal. That's problem number one in the world, is extreme poverty. The problem number two, what is your knee-jerk response? There are 3.5 billion people in this world. That's almost half of the world's population have never even heard not just the gospel, they never even heard the name of Jesus. That's another one of those travesties. It's a tragedy and a travesty that there are that many people that can't turn the radio on and hear. They can't grab their Bible. They can't talk to the Christian at work. They won't even see a Christian in their entire life. Never meet one. They'll never see a Bible. They'll never hear a, a message on the radio. That's the way these tribal people that where we work are. There, until six years ago, there wasn't a single Christian with a 500 miles with them. Kenya is a Christian nation. And you go into the cities, and there are churches everywhere. But none of those guys are going to these unreached people groups or unreached groups. None of them that I know of. And if they are, there are these name it and claim it prosperity guys that are going out there and saying, if you give God all of your goats, then he's going to bless you guys. And so he takes all those goats. He'll send a truck down later, a day or two later, and they loaded up all their goats, and they take them into town, they sell them, and they buy their clothes and their cars and their jewelry and all these things. And that's the gospel that's spreading throughout Kenya and throughout the world, not just Kenya. 3.5 billion people and seven unreached 
7,000 unreached people groups still exist in this world. But God, I'm busy. But God, I don't have the ability to reach them. But God, I don't have the money to help them. Or is it, but God? God wants it done. God's promised to do it. And he's promised to do it through us. Let's go to Mark chapter 6 really quick. And this is one of the, the most known miracles of Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000. And many times we talk about his prayer, and many times we talk about the bread, and many times we talk about um, you know, the miracle itself. But this time I'm, I think that I read through it, the Lord was impressing upon me that, yes, those things are important, but the point of this story is something I've never heard another preacher say. And I wonder what, if you have. So we're going to start chapter 6 of Mark in verse 35. And this is when, when Jesus and the disciples, I mean, they have had a nonstop schedule for weeks and months maybe even. They're healing, they're preaching, they're, they're helping people. They're doing all these things from sunrise to past sunset. And in fact, in, in, when we pick up the story, they are exhausted, and they had gone to this place to get away from everybody for a moment so that they could eat and they could rest. Um, Jesus had just heard that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded, and so he was sorrowful and sad and, and emotionally you know, exhausted, and he wanted to go and, and rest with his disciples for a few. But as soon as they get there, boom, thousands of people are there again. And what's he do? He starts healing, and he starts preaching, and he starts praying for people and helping people. So in verse 35, we're going to pick up that story where he says, When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is very late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding countrysides and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. But Jesus answered them, and he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy food or buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they found out, and they came back, and they said, we have five loaves and two fish. And you know the rest of the story. He did a marvelous, wonderful, awe-inspiring multiplication of food. And I've seen that. Maybe it wasn't as obvious, but we've taken $10,000 worth of food to 20,000 people. And everybody walked away with enough for a week. We thought they were going to walk away with enough for a day many times. But God multiplies. I send money over there um, several times a year, four times a year. And they go and they do their food distributions and they preach and they bring people to the Lord. And we plant churches way out in there in the middle of nowhere in the deserts of Kenya. Where the name of Jesus has never been heard before, and these people are getting saved, and they're getting a pinch of food, and you would think that they were in heaven already. When I used to go and step into these villages, you would walk in and you felt this oppression. Shelby has been there with me, and my wife as well, and another couple who is not here that form a part of Cry, the Cry team, or Team Cry, um, the Schusters, Renee and Jeff. Shelby spent two months with us and the Schusters um, there last year. And we spent a lot of time in these desert villages, very remote areas. Um, but the first couple of times before I brought groups out there, I would go out there and, and I think Britt was with me when I went the farthest at that time. We've gone about 100 miles past there now, um, out into the bush. But you kind of, the hair goes up on your arms, and these places are evil, and the people don't really like you, and they really don't want you there. They'll take your food in the beginning, but they really didn't want me there. They didn't want to shake my hand. They didn't want to talk to me, translator or not. They would stand back like this. 
and their voodoo dolls and their, you know, I never did see one twisting a neck yet like this yet, but I'm trying to get me. But there's sometimes where you get fearful when you're out there. And in these places where we're going now, I'm going back to some of these places for my second, third, and fourth time now, that since the gospel has been there. And you're going to see at the end of my talk, and when Shelby comes up, um, Shelby dancing with a bunch of Turkana women. Those Turkana women were all under a year old with the Lord. Those are the ones that were growling at me. Those are the ones who were standing back and going, who is this disgusting, ugly white man? We want nothing to do with you. And now when I go into these villages that have a church in it, and they're, they're getting Bibles, they can't read, but they're getting, um, what do they call them, the audio Bibles now in their languages out there. And, and uh, they hear that we're giving food occasionally and that we're giving you know, a well here and there and we're trying and we're trying to love on them and bring them to the Lord. But the last few times I've gone out there, they, they greet us in song and in dance. And they hug us and they shake our hands and they want to bring us into their little, little stick huts where they have nothing. They give me gifts. Can you imagine? We've got so much jewelry in our, in our house that we don't even know what to do with it. I've got Maasai elder staff back there. I've got larger staffs that are all carved up. I've got elder canes that, well, I call it a cane because I'm getting, I'm 63 now, but for them, it's a goat herding thing, you know, but only elders are allowed to own, the, own these things, the tribal elders. They come seeking me out to give me gifts now because they know, not because I bring them food, because I don't dish the food out. I never do. I don't let them see that I'm a part of that. They know, but they know that I'm there to encourage the word of God. And they've seen the change. These people are in tribal war. They've still, they've been in tribal war for generations, the Samburu and the Turkanas. The Turkanas are killing the Samburu for a cow. The Samburu turn around and kill five or six people, five or six men in a village, and sometimes women and children get in the way and just to take a goat or two. And it goes back and forth. They have a dowry over there to where you can't get married unless you give the in-laws 10 cows. In fact, I'm doing a wedding in Samburu in January, Samburu County, um, which scares me to death. <laughs> Uh, they're cultural, and you got to kill a goat in front of the doorstep and all that. I'm not going to do that. I told him I won't do that stuff, but I'll preach. Um, but that guy, for I've known him for three years. He's one of our pastors. And since he started getting $75 a month, he still eats a pinch every week or two, or every few days of food, and he gives $70 every quarter towards a cow. He's bought five cows now. I just sent money for two more cows and enough money to do a great big shindig. We're going to have a great big celebration for one of our first Calvary Chapel pastors who is going to get married. They're going to kill goats. They're going to kill cows. They're going to bring all kinds of stuff that I probably won't touch. You want to come? You can, you can eat some of that stuff. He's brave. I am too, but I love traveling with him. So we're at the story of the disciples, and the disciples are saying, there's a big problem here, God. All these people, they have nothing to eat. Send them away. Make sure that they go away so that we can have some time off. We are tired, and we're hungry, and we're tired of this. You keep healing, and you keep teaching, and it's time to get away again. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And then they say, well, we don't have enough money to do that, and there's not... There, we can't feed all these people, thinking that they were off the hook. And the next verse, in verse 38, he says, Jesus says to them, well, how much do you have? And I think that's the question for all of us. Whether it be time, whether it be prayer, whether it be energy, whether it be ability, how much do you have to reach out to the people that are hurting around you first and in the world? I think it's our responsibility. I think it's our call. I think it is our legacy as Christians 
we are called to be problem solvers, not just little problem solvers. Whether it be in the grocery store and some and a single mom doesn't have enough money to feed to to pay the bill that it's going up too. I've seen it before, and I've watched other people do it. I haven't had the opportunity yet. Maybe I'm not looking hard enough. But I saw a guy the, the other day throw down a twenty dollar bill to help a lady to pay her bill because she was putting things back. That's what God calls us to do: to be problem solvers in our immediate zone, but not to forget about the world zone because God doesn't forget about it. God wants the whole world to come to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So they go off and they find out how many fish they have. They have five loaves and two stinky fish can you imagine what those things smelled like out there? Your pastor is out there really close to where they were. Well, he was. I saw pictures the other day. He was really close to the Sea of Galilee up there. Um, but they weren't off the hook. He made them put what they had have at the feet of Christ. God doesn't want to do everything himself. He has asked us to be a partner with him. He's asked us to, to give what we have, what we not only what we can, but sometimes enough to where it actually hurts. My wife and I sold our house three years ago so we could do this ministry. It's, I'm not saying that to say that I'm this way, but God had called me so strongly and so clearly through a lot of these verses that I shared with you today that I could not continue on in the lifestyle that I was living as a general contractor. I was told to, sell, to shut down my business and to sell my house and to trust him by faith again. Ten years in Mexico wasn't enough. Two years in Grenada wasn't enough. Fourteen years of traveling to 20 different countries wasn't enough. I still want some more from me, and that's why I'm here. Being obedient because I've seen the travesties out there. I've seen the hunger, and I've seen those who have never heard the emptiness that's in their faces. You people here are empty, but you see somebody who has never heard the name of Jesus and they're hollow. There really is absolutely nothing spiritual in these people. I think what I want to leave with you today is the message that God is speaking to me. Going back to Psalm chapter 72, I'm going to read it just in a little different twist. It says to me, I am God and I will rescue the poor who cry out and the afflicted who have no helper. I will spare the poor and I will save the souls of the needy. Don't chase away the crowds, Lane. Don't hope that somebody else will be there to fill in the gap. I've got this. Come now. I'm sending you. I want you to be a part of the solution. I want you to give them something to eat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity. And I get emotional because I've heard your voice and I've heard your word speaking to me. And I've seen the pain and I've seen the heartache and I've seen the, the lost groveling for life. And now I've seen the, the other part of that, the but God, and how you want to transport communities and, and whole countries, how you want to bring churches and the gospel into these areas who have maybe even been hostile to you in the past. That they would lay down their false gods and that they would stand by your side and that you would bless them and that in turn they would be a blessing to the villages that surround them and the village people who are killing each other over food. I thank you, Father, for these messages, and I pray that we would all take them at heart, and that as we read of your miracle of the fish and the 5,000, or bread and the 5,000, Lord, that we remember. The main point of that story is that we give them something to eat. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, 
sound and visual guy back there. What was your name again? Dick. There we go. And this is going to go automatic. And um, I just want to briefly share again for those. How many was here the, two years ago when I spoke? Two people. You didn't realize that I spoke the same message as I did last time, right? No. Um, so you might remember a little bit, and I see some of our paraphernalia back there. This church has been behind Calvary Relief International. Thank you to, to Britt and to, to Jay. Um, I think Jay has been there with Stephen um, and in Turkana area. No, he hasn't. I know Britt has. But if you go out there, when you go out there, our table's on the right-hand side, and there's a stand-up sign there, and it's got a church plant, our very first church plant in Turkana, um, northern Kenya. And the guy in the red shirt, his name is Stephen. He's standing there like this. He is so proud. We have now planted 16 churches in that, er in that area within an hour's walk from each other. We've drilled the well out there, and we've um, brought, I don't know, probably close to a half a million dollars worth of food out there in the last six years. Um, we just got done, you'll see up here, motorcycles, we've got 16, it's actually more than that now for pastors because it, they're so remote that it takes them three days to walk to go buy a bag of something if they even have money to do it. Um, so now they can reach five or six villages, each, each pastor in a week, and they do. We have 25 graduates. I'm gonna, they've postponed their graduation from December to January when I'm there, and um, I get to be the, the keynote speaker at their graduation, Calvary Chapel School of Ministry, where 25 guys are willing and ready to leave their houses in what you would call a, a village to go into these non-village communities and to live and to reach the unreached. We also work with Anchored Hope Schools, um, Pastor Gitu and Miriam. Um, you can see all these people and all these ministries on our website at calvaryreliefinternational.org, calvaryreliefint.org. We have some handouts for you. I would encourage you to please go and, and see um, our website. It's not professionally done. I did it. I'm a carpenter, not a web guy. Any web guys here that want to help? Um, but we do our best. I watched Pinocchio last night. Did you see that new Pinocchio on television? The guy says, we do our best. And what is, what is that saying? The little Jiminy Cricket used to say, we do our best, and that's all we can do. And that's what this ministry is about, is having a heart, is letting our heart be broken by the same things that break the heart of God, and doing something about it, stepping in and making a difference. Has God called you to be a problem solver or a problem ignorer? Do we turn our back when we see somebody in need because we're busy or because we're preoccupied or we don't have the ability or we don't have the money or do we step in and help? And that's the question today. We're in the end times. I highly believe that. You can't look at the newspaper or turn on the TV and thank God I don't have a TV anymore. But you can't be alive today and not realize that the world is going to hell quickly, going downhill. That's our new tractor and our new trailer and new water trailer to get food and building materials farther out into the bush. That was our latest well. These people used to have to walk five or 10 miles one way. It would take them three days sometimes to go and get three-gallon thing, and these poor little girls with three gallons of water on their head walking all the way down there and all the way back. Their parents would give them a, a bottle like this, too. They love these things. They, they don't let us throw these away. They come and clear our trucks out with of them. And um, th that's what they get to drink all the way back. They can't touch that water that's on their head. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. We, we, we plant churches, we feed the poor, we train leaders, we have three schools of ministry. We work in Burundi, which is over by Rwanda with Jean-Pierre. You guys are supporting Jean-Pierre's ministry. He works in Burundi and he also works in the Congo with the pygmies, um, literal pygmies. You know, Jean-Pierre's my, my height, maybe a little shorter than me. And 
these guys are like this, adults. And then the children are obviously smaller than that. But these guys are poorer than poor. They live in the jungles of the Congo. And they have been chased out recently by a new spur of new wars. And they've been chased into Burundi, which makes it easier for them to reach to them. Oh, the Calvary Relief International and you guys here in this church paid for 85 of those pygmy children to go to school, some of them, most of them, for the first time in their lives because they're out of the Congo and in Burundi now. We give them food. We give them the gospel. They do. Our, our ministry, our responsibility is to take these pastors who are doing the work and coming alongside of them and resourcing them to be able to do the work that God has called them to do. So at this time, I'm going to call Shelby up, and she has a special offer for some of you. Some of you, I mean, Kenya or Africa is like, absolutely not. But some of you, you might have an idea that maybe I've challenged you, I hope. It, it's kind of a, a grueling trip. It, it's hard and it's long, and but it's fruitful. And I want to encourage you, if you're physically sound, to come with me to some of these places, they would love to hear a new voice besides mine. They would hear, love to know that they are a part of a bigger worldwide church. This, I, this is video and some of these pictures are my favorite. So here's Shelby. Come on up. Don't be shy. You can turn on the video. <laughs> oh, that's so special. Well, good morning, everybody. It's an honor to be here and to just fellowship with you guys today. It is my first time here, and I'm so excited to just share a little bit about myself and what the Lord has been doing in my life, and also um, the special opportunity if you guys wanted to be part of any of these things that we're talking about. Um, so just a quick little recap. Um, as Lane said, I met um, him and Cindy about three years ago, and um, I got saved in the middle of 2018. And just a few months after I got saved, the Lord called me to be a missionary. So two very big things in a short amount of time, and that made me feel very uh, humbled. Um, everything changed a lot in that time, and I felt kind of like that, but God kind of feeling. And um, so Lane and Cindy were definitely a huge gift to me, and they really just discipled me in the word, um, first and foremost, for that foundation, but also what does any of that mean and why? Why is it important that this calling has been placed on all of our lives um, to share the gospel, to share the word of God? Um, so after that, um, about a year later, I left overseas for the first time. I went to the country of Hungary, and I went to Bible college there. And um, from Hungary, I went to, um, there was a little intermittent time from what we all know of as COVID. And so I came back home, and then... Um, the opportunity came for me to actually go, to go to Kenya. And I remember when I got asked, um, I just like jumped up in the air because I was so excited. And I remembered in that moment that the reason I think it was such an initial yes and a response is because the Lord revealed to me that throughout these different parts of my life, before I even knew him, I had dreams. I would have dreams of these little brown faces and I would get random messages of things that like I would write down and I didn't know why but that I would share one day to these little brown faces um and throughout the word I think something I really see and is this model that Jesus portrays of a come and see come and sit with me let me tell you about all of this and that's actually how I got saved um the day I got saved the pastor was sharing a message and he was in the book of Ezekiel, and I had no idea, obviously, what he was talking about. But at the end, he said exactly that. You can't know. You cannot know any of these things until you let go and you let God show you. And he will. But Jesus doesn't just stop there. And the message that Lane was sharing, too, it's, okay, God, we have this problem. And Jesus is like, I've already shown you. It's your turn. Now you go and you tell. You feed. 
you share. And so that was what the Lord allowed me to do in going to Kenya this time, to go and see, but also to tell all of these different things that he had shared with me, because you can't share what you don't know or what you don't have. Um, so we got to partake in some hut-to-hut evangelism. We got to just witness these miraculous things, and it's one of those things, it's like you wake up in the morning and you have this agenda, but nothing goes according to plan because it's not ours. It's the Lord's, and he has... Um, He's not messing around, you guys. <laughs> he is on a mission, and he's inviting us to be part of it. Um, one thing that I think the Lord has really opened my eyes to is we have this word, right? We have the word of God, and we look at it, and it has all these different stories, all these different scriptures, all these different chapters and books, and we're like, okay, this is great. Now what do I do with this? But something very significant that I think is so easy to miss is that God is on a singular mission. It is not just this compilation of all these different things and David and Goliath, as you were saying, or all of that. It's one singular redemptive mission from the Garden of Eden to the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, John witnesses this amazing vision in Revelation 7, 9, where there is this throne of the Lord. He is there. He is the lamb and a, um, a people or a, yeah, a representation from every tribe, tongue, and nation is there worshiping this lamb. And so the question is, so that's going to happen, so how are we going to get there? It is a promise from God that at least someone from all of these people groups is coming out and going to worship him. So one of the difficult things, I think, I mean, we're just one person, right? And so the the... the burdens and all of these things are so overwhelming. And that was a question I had to face myself. God, really? I'm just one person. And it's, I remember just one night just sitting on the ground in my room and just feeling so overwhelmed. And it is, it's just like, wow. But you know, I was thinking sitting here today, I was thinking of Esther. And I was just thinking of, you know, what if for such a time as this, you have been called and you have been placed. And what God can do with one willing vessel is more than we can even imagine or think. And that one village um, that was up there, um, I didn't get to be part of it, but a couple years ago, or a few years ago, they had went to the same village. And um, a friend of mine was there, and she said that the same feeling, it was just your skin crawling and you're like backing up, and then not long after, they're worshiping the Lord. So it was very miraculous. Um, so I wanted to share a story with you guys, if I can, just for, for a minute or so. And it actually, um, again, it just came to me. I was reminded of it just sitting here. And I, I think I will title it the best day of my life. And I think it'll make sense in just a minute. But there was one day um, we were... We were talking about in Kenya this big trip that we were planning for. It was towards the latter latter part of our trip there. And um, we were at Gitu's church, one of the pastors that CRI supports. And the church is just praying. They're like, wow, we just really pray you guys are coming back. And it's like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Because um, I hadn't heard much about it. And so all of a sudden, I'm just shaken and I'm a bit afraid. And so... We get ready for this trip, we head up there, and there's these people with guns and things, and it's just like, what's going on? Um, and then we get to well, the place that we're staying, and uh, Gitu tells me, he says, Shelby, if you hear gunshots, run to your room and shut the door and don't come out. I'm like, obviously, just shell-shocked and not very excited about that. So I went into my room. And I just wept. I was like, God, I don't care where you take me. Just get me out of here. <laughs> and um, the Lord really ministered to me in that moment. And something Lane said, too. He's like, Shelby, you don't have to go. And so I just, kept, I just sat with that. I was like, okay, I don't have to go. But I felt like the Lord really said, yeah, you don't have to go. But if you do go, I will show you what I want to do. And so I, I just felt this assurance, you know, and that the Lord was there. And so I got out of the room, and all of a sudden we start walking 
around in this village, and in this certain village, there's two different sides. One side is one tribe, and the other side's another tribe, and um, they hate each other. They are not friends. And so we, um, we were walking with Pastor Stephen down the middle of the road to signify the unification of Christ that he wants to do. And then all of a sudden, all these children start swarming, all these little brown faces. And we're just walking, and we're starting, we just count to one, one to 100 and just playing these different games. And all of, um, we were doing Jesus loves me in sign language because you, you, you're laying and, you know, all of them, they're evangelizing. And I'm just with all these children like, <laughs> what do you say? You don't speak the same language. You don't, you don't know what to do. You can't really in that moment give them a theological something or other. They're just looking at you to see who are you. They're looking into your eyes. What are they seeing? And it was in that moment that the love of Christ is a universal language because it is his language. And there are no barriers with Christ. Um, and I remember that day, ending that day, laying my head in the same bed that I had once wept in, asking for God to get me out, saying, Lord, if I died today, I would be so satisfied with what you have done. So the offer that we are wanting to offer you guys is that come and see model to come with us. And it's something that we're calling a missions team mobilizer, that if you wanted to be part of putting a team together, we will pay your round trip ticket to come with us and to see and to experience what God is doing in a different nation, a different context, um, and to put together that team. And we will work with you and help you in any way that's needed um, just to experience that because I think that's what changes everything. You know, we talk about these things and it's like, it just sounds so far away and it is in some ways, but. You know, if God is putting that on your heart to be part of, we would love to do that with you. So that is what we were offering. Um, so one last thing, um, the biggest barrier, I believe, are the reasons to say no. There are countless, countless reasons to say no. In fact, I heard all of them, probably. And you have to sort those out, you know, whatever they may be. We all have our different things. But I kind of came to this place that there is all of the reasons to say no, but the greatest reason to say yes is because he is worthy, and he will be the one that we worship before the throne, whether it be now or later, but we will. And God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Thank you, guys. She's like our sixth, sixth or seventh daughter now. We have two of our own, and then a bunch of other adopted ones too. Um, I've been elected to send you guys home. So I want to pray for you one more time. And just a reminder that you know we are offering um, one person to help organize at least three or four other people to, from your church to come, or other churches, or Bible studies you're involved in. The, the purpose of this is letting you see. Come and see. Let me see what the great things that God are doing in, in these areas. And uh, the second one is so that people talk about CRI, because we can't do this alone. It's a body thing. And one word of real encouragement is that missionaries back in the 18s and late 1700s, they used to pack all their clothes in a coffin because they knew they weren't coming home. We got airplanes now, and we got suitcases, and we're coming home most of the time. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this fellowship, the support that they have been um, in the past and that they have already expressed they want to be in the future. I pray, Father, that the funds and the prayers and uh, the media and all these things, Father, would work together for good for those that you love in very desperate situations. So I pray, Father, for this group, this um, Fam, part of our family, Calvary Chapel family, Lord, that they would continue to step out into faith and to say, but God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You guys have a beautiful day. We have our table back there, and we are encouraging um, some donations, obviously, and reoccurring donations. You do that right now, you get a free hat. And then we got hats out there for 25 bucks, and all 100% of this goes to food and church planting. Thank you, guys.